I'm happy to have Chuck Kelly with us. Chuck's retired. Do you want to be retired like Chuck? Let's find out. Uh, you got to allow me to share my screen, buddy. Oh, I, I, I should. I did, and I will. And I will, and I did. All right, here we go. So, as Barry said, I retired a, a couple of years ago now. And I'm enjoying the heck out of it. And when I go to SBE meetings, because I still go, or other meetings, I find a sea of gray hair or no hair. And uh, so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody here or looking at your photos or anything like that. But I thought maybe I'd share my thought process with each of you. Um, and I hope you'll think about it um, because that's the only purpose of this. I can't tell you what to do. Yours is completely different than anybody else's and certainly different than mine. But the idea here is just to think about retirement because I find too many people never, ever think about it. And I will share a story. Back at the beginnings of my career, after I'd been chief engineer at several stations, but just when I had joined ITC, if anybody remembers the cart machine company, Jack Jenkins was the president and a good friend. And about six months after I joined ITC, Jack went over to a lawyer's office and sold ITC to 3M. And he drove away from his lawyer's office, having signed over the company, with a check for $4 million. And he was headed to his bank. And about halfway there, he had a heart attack. And he suffered quadruple bypass. And he spent pretty much the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And afterwards, he told me, he said, Chuck, because so we were good friends, he said, Chuck, I didn't understand how to interpret my life without thinking about what it said on my business card. I was who it said on my business card, and I'd never been anything different, and I didn't know who I was driving to that bank. So with that rather poignant story, I just want to open your mind a little bit to thinking about retirement. You may not be ready, and that's fine, but you need to think about it, and, and, and at least a little bit in the future. What this presentation isn't, when you get to close to my age, you get nonstop mail about managing your retirement portfolio, suggestions on Medicare supplement plans and retirement budgets. This isn't any of that. There's plenty of people that want to talk to you about that, and I don't even Dane to think about it. What it is, is understanding what it means not to have a job to go to. Understanding how you see yourself post-retirement. What will your business card say? How to avoid the psychological shock that Jack Jenkins had. And learning to prepare for your new reality. I did some reading. I, this is my nature. I did some reading. I found a book called Independence Day. I recommend it by Steve Lopez. On page 60, he talked about the six basic categories of retirees. There are continuers who fit their existing skills to some modified use. There are easy gliders. They know no plan. They just take every day as it comes. Adventurers make big changes, try new things, some daring. Searchers who reflect on the meaning of their lives and contemplate what to do. Involve spectators, remain in career field, but in a different role, and retreaters who take a break, perhaps permanently, trying to figure out what to do every day. And that you can have a combination of these, and you can even evolve from one to the other to the other. But it's important for you to think about these various roles and how you might fit into them. Now, a continuer, what they might do, help out with AV at a church, teach at a community college, build and operate an LPFM. I know people that do every one of these. Become an SBE mentor. I'm mentor to two people at the moment. Get involved with amateur radio if you haven't already. Good thing to do. Easy gliders, what do they do? They play golf or poker. Babysit grandchildren as necessary. I do that a lot. Be spontaneous and open to last-minute opportunities. But having no set schedule can be dangerous because activity is important. Retirement is what... Uh, get this window out of the way here. Oops. Retirement is when you stop 
living at work and start working at living. I remember when I was working at Broadcast Electronics and Larry Servone came up to me one day and he says, Chuck, he says, do you think I should retire? And I said, Larry, you've made all the money you ever need and your kids aren't interested in running the business. Let me ask you a question. Do you work to live or do you live to work? And after that, he retired. Um, adventurers, what do they do? They start a home business, go back to college, move overseas. I know people that do all of these. Move into an RV and travel constantly. Not a bad idea. Searchers, what do they do? They try a lot of things and they see what makes them happy. They're always willing to change course on a dime. And they're introspective. They think about who they are and what they want to be. And they understand themselves, perhaps more than they ever did in the corporate work environment. And they see the freedom from a fixed career as the best part of retirement. How nice would it be for you not to have to answer that phone because there's an off-the-air station in the middle of the night? Or how not nice would it be not to have that responsibility and feel you're needed? Involve spectators. What do we do? And this is me. I attend SBE meetings and trade shows even though they're retired. If I asked for a, a show of hands among all of us uh, uh, at this luncheon, how many of us are actually retired? And yet we're here. Um, assisting other engineers occasionally, all of the fun, none of the pressure, or volunteer at the local public radio station or LPFM on air. And retreaters, these are people that have worked so hard in their life, they say, you know, I really haven't thought of what I'm going to do next, but I'm just going to take a break for a little bit to relax because I deserve it. I've, I've worked my butt off all my life, but a short break often becomes longer and a permanent couch potato condition can shorten your life. Retreater, repeaters, retreaters rather, tend to retire to the graveyard. There's, there's none of these things that I've mentioned. None of these six choices are a bad idea except this one. Don't be a retreater. Typical statistics from the Labor Department. This is how people typically spend their time who are retired. Four and a half hours of watching TV per day. I don't do that. Relaxing and leisure, probably. Sleeping nine hours, I wish. But you can see all the other choices here. And it's, it's not that this is what you should aim for. This is just the media. It is pair yourself to others and see how you fit into this thing. You know, do you, do you spend more than four-tenths of an hour on a, on a daily basis doing lawn and garden, um, et cetera, et cetera? These are things that that uh, people have done and continue to do, and you should, you might consider stacking yourself up against. I'll give you a chance to read the cartoon on the left. It's funny because it's really true. Retirement has effects on our significant others. I remember hearing the story about a guy who said he was going to alphabetize the kitchen and uh, probably the frying pan was out well, well, uh, well deserved. It's important to discuss your retirement with the others in your household because it's going to affect everybody, including not only your family, but your friends. And in fact, it's a transition. And you should view it that way from your old life to your new life. Here's 25 things that U.S. News and World Report says are the most popular things to do when you retire. I'll let you read this, and I'm going to give Barry a PDF of this presentation so you don't have to sit there and scribble if you don't want to. But these are things that people do when they're retired, and you need to think about it and, and think about what you might enjoy doing and, uh, and not enjoy doing. There's going to be a ton of time, by the way, to discuss this after I'm done, because it's really not that long of a presentation. The biggest value in this presentation is helping to get people to think and then to share their ideas with everybody else here. Some things to remember. Your retirement is as, you, is as unique as you are. My ideas aren't yours. And, and this is really important. I like this one. Analyze what things you did in your career that you loved and what things you hated. Do what you loved and do them on your schedule. That's really how I've implemented my retirement. Um, I, to me, that's the most important thing. And, and you really start a year in advance. You start a year before you're going to retire. And you think about 
and analyze the things that you're doing that you love and what things you actually despise and plan your retirement so you do more of what you love and do it on your schedule. Retirement is not a step function. Retirement is not running up to this date and then stopping and doing nothing. It's a gradual transition. And as a matter of fact, your retirement will change over time as your health, your family, and your finances change. And the key here is to manage that transition as you as everything changes, making the most of all the resources that you have. And from time to time, this is one of my favorites, from time to time, it's bizarre. Everybody thinks it's this crazy, but I'll tell you, this is my, my feeling. From time to time, when facing a fork in the road, imagine yourself laying on your deathbed, knowing you're never going to get up out of that bed, looking back on the things you didn't do but wish you had, as well as the things that you did do that you wish you hadn't, and make your decisions accordingly. I don't know if that's valuable to you, but it's always been valuable to me. And that's, it's not the end, but it's a new beginning. Happy retirement. This is where the discussion begins. I hope, Barry, you're going to unmute everybody and let everybody jump in here because that's the end of my prepared presentation. Well, good. Anyone can, uh, of course, unmute themselves with an alternate A or space bar or raise your hand and I'll see that and I'll unmute you. And we uh, certainly can talk about any of these aspects. And it's interesting to, to see how, uh, in fact, it's a different way of thinking than many of us are used to. I agree with Mark at KLUX. Um, that's that's a that's a person who's continuing on a continuer. That's it. That's exactly what many of us do. By the way, I see many friends on here, and I know many of them are in, uh, in, in, um, what's the right word, in transition to exactly what I've gone through. And hopefully you're all thinking about exactly this. Hey, Gordon. Um, I'll, I'll put hey. my two cents worth in. Hi, Gordon. Uh, hi, Chuck. Good to see you again. Good to see um, you, my friend. It's hard to believe that it's, been 14 years since I officially retired already. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm one of those guys that says, how did I ever get anything done when I was working full time? Because it seems like there just isn't enough time to do everything. And um, I'm, I found myself in a couple of your categories. Um, I'm working two days a week for a radio station. I'm sitting here with a project nearing completion, a, a pet project uh, for a high-quality phono preamp. And most of the people on this in this group know what that is. It's amazing how many people don't. <laughs> um, and my involvement with my church has changed. Um, we changed churches because we were in a big church and it was just getting to the point where we felt that anything that we could do was just way too taxing in that big church. So we went from a church of 350 to a church of 35. And we feel much more comfortable there at this point. And um, again, like you said, Chuck, it's not for everybody. My retirement uh, was less of a transition than, uh, or more of a step because I wasn't expecting to re retire when I did. They 
made an offer I couldn't refuse. I was thinking of retirement five to 10 years down the road, but they made an offer I couldn't refuse. So um, here I am. I love what I do. And um, I, in addition to all of that, I finally have time to work on my trains. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it, uh, it's good stuff, but I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. You got to do something and um, find, find what you're comfortable with. Um, one, one role that I've taken on that I didn't quite expect was that of a mentor. Um, where I work, we have recent within the last year to year and a half we've taken on several mm, young men new guys in the in the field and uh i get the i get the job of showing them smart things and dumb things how to solder Amazing how many people don't know how to solder these days. And, um, but on the other hand, I don't stop learning. I have one guy, one of the guys say that I'm the only person he knows of in my age group that have anywhere near the understanding of computers and networking that I do. Um, he says, and that's, that's unusual. You got to keep learning. I'm right now. I'm my big challenge is learning how to repair surface mount. Mm. Uh, how do you see you got to first, you got to see it, Gordon. Well, that that's what big magnifying glasses are good for. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and they're done that. Chuck, I think one of the questions that uh, probably comes up here, uh, have you addressed, is to how early in a career should someone be planning? Uh, you know, it all depends on you and, and your situation. I, there's no, that I know of, there's no set formula. Um, when do you start? dreading going to work? When do you start dreading when the phone rings? Um, are you financially, this is where the financial part comes in, but I have nothing to do with that. When do you think that you can continue the life that you're um, comfortable with financially without having to go in every day? Mm -hmm. oh, make, uh, and there's another point here too, and that is that, that like Gordon, he, he was surprised when retirement happened upon him but there are other people that are surprised when retirement happens upon them for health reasons. They don't really have a choice in the world. And, you know, I remember attending the funerals of a number of different friends in the broadcast industry, good friends, good people who I'm older than, and they've passed away. And it's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing. I went to a funeral today. I sing in a church choir like you, Gordon. I, I attend a church and I've been a part of a choir with 70 people in it and uh, one of our my fellow basses passed away monday and uh went to his funeral i sang at his funeral today you never can tell we get to this age and we are in the age group when this starts happening and you know we need to manage this process we don't we're not in control of it but we need to manage our capability i don't know if that's an answer to your question barry but it's best i can do well, it's a good way to look at it, certainly. And I've <laughs> I've known guys that want to retire the day after they start. And I know some guys that actually did retire, even though they were still putatively working. Uh, it's all a day attitude, isn't it? Robert, I thought I saw you pop up there. Were you uh, going to add something? Um, I think sometimes it turns on uh, because my monitors are a bit loud. Oh, well. 
But I'm going Somebody to else is going to be able to add something to this conversation? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm in the middle of that transition myself right now. These are all really good points. Would you like what to you help, 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 help you helps you think about it all? One thing I'd like to add, um, when I was discussing this with, with my wife, we had, by the way, from the time it the thought occurred until the um, time I had to make a decision was exactly one weekend. They told me about it Friday and I had to make a decision by Monday. Um, and I was talking with my wife and she said in no uncertain terms, you will find something to do outside of the house. Remember, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. It goes to that cartoon that uh, that Chuck showed. Yeah, yeah. I know that one of the things that uh, over the years uh, that I have noticed with some of the folks in the industry is marriages do tend to get strained. In the old days, from the overnight work, and uh, today there is and travel and travel. I said, yes, yes, and that's really what it is today, more so because uh, I know one fellow who, good grief, you look at his sig, and there's over a thousand miles in his uh, area of of responsibility, not just a hundred, a thousand. And I don't see how you can cover all that, even if you're a private pilot. For sure, when you travel a lot, I'm looking at you, Jeff Wilson. Um, when you travel a lot, there are sacrifices. It's it's helpful to be able to put the kids through college and, and all those wonderful things to put bread on the table. But there's a sacrifice. There's a price to be paid. And if you can retire early as a result of that sacrifice and give the time to the extended family, and kind of make it up a little bit. That's not a bad thing. That's and exactly. it does take a very special woman at the other end. Mm -hmm. I've seen a few of wives that have come along with their husbands and actually lend a hand at work. But, you know, aside from Mary, this is almost a complete male group. I don't know the the, the genders on, on YouTube. We have over a dozen or so there. But this is an issue. Uh, we have a couple of gals that check with, it, uh, with us periodically. But it's largely a male group. And so wives had, need to have consideration. That's why I use the phrase significant other, because my wife is actually a broadcast engineer and she has not retired. My wife runs a company that, that um, installs and maintains radio stations in the Phil and television stations in the Philippines. And uh, so one of the intricacies here of retirement is managing the fact that I'm retired and she's not. That's a little bit more interesting. Well, it's the flip side, isn't it, of, of what... Mm -hmm. Gordon was talking about. That's right. Yeah, and, and he's right about a special woman. Um, as of day before yesterday, I've been married for 39 years, and my wife has has been to every transmitter site that I've ever taken care of. And uh, even if it's just to be there to read a book so I don't get into trouble and she can get help. Um, she understands she understands the the, the one two o'clock in the morning call from the transmitter that something's not right and having to get up and go out um, it does take a it does take a special gal to to be able to put up with that congratulations to you both thank you good to see you Chuck see you mark <laughs> My wife stopped visiting uh, me when she saw me climbing a 200 foot tower. She said, I, I can't, I can't watch you do that anymore. 
my wife said to me uh, the other day, when, when will there be a day you don't answer the phone and say within five seconds, is it plugged in? <laughs> or unplug it and replug it. <laughs> Reboot. Did you check the fuse? Hey, Chuck, does that make you feel good? Do you know how many, uh, how it's been years, but do you know how many times I used to say, okay, I need to order a bunch of five microfarad capacitors now? Sure. Absolutely. It's funny when you watch the, the broadcast boards, um, how often the answer to somebody's how do you fix this is replace the dry capacitors. Everybody says recap it. No, it's not just broadcast. I'm I'm a member of several real to real tape recorder groups and or stereo groups, and everybody's like, "Oh, I got a popping in my fifty uh, year old stereo." Oh, well, recap it, recap it. Exactly. That and no, no, nobody under uh, I guess forty understands the term shotgun. And it's worth the money to have an ESR meter too. You can find those dry caps real quick. Just grateful we're not cleaning pressure rollers anymore. But have you I ever had those days. someone to just hit it <laughs> to make it work? And it I miss, worked. I miss cleaning heads on tape machines. I wish we could go back to that. I still or do it. it. <laughs> I still maintain a bunch then. of reel to reels, and and you know my uh, Q-tips and isopropyl alcohol are always in the toolkit. I always you didn't hit it hard enough. Always carried a box around the station that had uh, all that stuff in it to take care of that, even, and, even realignment stuff. And how and many just, people really believe that that stuff really rejuvenated pinch rollers? I never had a, uh, those liquids that never worked, right? No, no, no. Yeah, they Since, dried out eventually. Yep, send the rollers to Terry's rubber rollers and have him rebuild them. Yep, that's, there that's you go. That's the way works. And then at ITC, we decided it was a good idea to have capstans made of ceramic so you could clean those too. Mm -hmm. Or smoke detectors uh, disabled when you were running the ELSA all the time. Mm. My very first sales trip for ITC, I was sent out to Washington, D.C. to visit with DC-101, and I walked in, and they had a whole bunch of 99As. And they were loaded for bear when I walked in the door. And I didn't know squat about Elsa and the race coils and burning up and all that. And I got back after Scott um, Smith had told me uh, everything I needed to know. And uh, licking my wounds, I got back to the office in Bloomington, Illinois. And I went back to the manufacturing area. that We, we had the wave solder machine. And on the wave solder machine, it was where the ELSA boards would come across and get soldered at the bottom. And it so happened that one of the ELSA carts fell into the soup, fell into the hot solder. And they brought it out, and it, all the capacitors had popped. It was covered in, in, uh, in, in solder from one end to the other. And I said, put that in a stat bag, and let's send it out to DC-101 and tell them to try the newest version. I made friends with them ever since. Joel, um, I see your note here in the chat. And so I'm going to uh, invite you to comment about your view of retirement at 40. Well, 40. I'm actually under 40, but uh, I am looking at retirement is still something uh, 40 to 50 years away, but it doesn't start doesn't hurt to start thinking about it. And the most important thing is hearing about it from people who have been there. And obviously, I, if I wait until then, I'll be hearing from my peers. And well, another question uh, becomes, I think another question becomes, what is happening to our industry as a whole? What is the trajectory of over-the-air broadcasting? You know, when you talk about somebody like you, Joel, you know, where is broadcasting going to, be, going to be 40 to 50 years from now? Absolutely. When I was uh, in school and 15 years ago, whatever, 
um, I was planning to become a shortwave broadcast engineer. And uh, by the time I got towards graduation, I realized that the, the window for that being a career field was closing pretty rapidly. Uh, even at now, I've been in chief engineer for a, a kilowatt AM, but I haven't really had any opportunities to do anything else in the AM field. And I'm seeing that field is also closing. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind trying to, to help out with AMs as it is, but I think there's an awful lot of people um, from generations like a lot of <laughs> where a lot of you guys are, uh, where when you pass away or are no longer able to do it, um, there's going to be a lot of stations that no longer exist. Yeah, the whole whole end of AM has uh, been predicted a few dozen times. And uh, EAS notwithstanding, and the current congressional uh, bill that uh, wants to mandate AM in vehicles. But the industry itself has changed so dramatically in the sense of what is being broadcast and how many stations there are that are no more than a computer and layout system. Or uh, like in Southern Maine, I've got a kilowatt AM that just keeps up a translator, but I got to keep the AM happy. Yeah. Or we'll say that from an international standpoint, AM is still doing very, very well. Thank you very much. You know, I, in the latter part of my career, I put an awful lot of AM stations on outside of the United States, and it's still going very, very well. So I, you know, it, it has to do with what the population has for receivers and so much of the population globally, not, not so much in the U.S., but so much of the population globally has access to AM and not much else. So let's ask the question, is, is that uh, largely DRM or is it standard AM? Standard AM. Mm -hmm. I would, I, I think that the population, and this may be, you know, I've, I've been a part of, of, of promulgating HD, and I've been a part of promulgating DRM. I was on the steering committee for DRM. And there's a whole heck of a lot more HD out there than there is DRM. Unfortunately, I like DRM, but it's it's not technology that's getting the job done. And when you think about DRM, it's very much like all digital HD, almost the same. Chuck, we have to have you back just to talk about war stories and Things this is like. what you this is what you accumulate when you get old, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go let's go back to our our main thought here about retirement. And we have several folks that are are completely retired, I think. Um, I think Walt, you're one of them. Uh, could we ask you a question or two about your retirement status? Sure. Uh I retired about 25 years ago. Uh, for 10 years, I did part-time uh, uh, consulting uh, and uh, work. A lot of carried a field set in the field through swamps uh, and so forth uh, quite a bit. Uh, that lasted about 10 years, and then I got involved in other things. and and sort of ran out of steam for that. And um, my wife and I did quite a bit of cruising. And after she died, I've been um, living in a small apartment in a retirement community and uh, uh, not doing uh, anywhere near as much. Well, we're sorry to hear about your wife, first of all. But uh, we're glad to have you with us most weeks. It seems like you have some experience and knowledge to pass on and don't don't get a chance to hear from you often enough. But you do find that, uh, well, there's a reason you might, you come every every week or so. Well, after 50-some uh, years in the broadcast industry, starting when I was in high school, working in a radio repair shop, remember those? Um, uh, I sort of uh, 
retain some interest in what's going on. Um, uh, there is a number of ways the industry has gone that make me very glad to be retired. Uh, the EAS uh, situation is one of them. Uh, but uh, I'm still interested in uh, you know, what's going on. And uh, uh, that's, I guess, why I uh, continue my involvement. Well, Chuck, that's one of your categories, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A continuer. You bet. And in fact, all of us, to a certain extent, those of us who are retired or looking at it are often continuers. And I think that's great. You know, it's, it's wonderful. I've been a part of starting a couple of LPFM stations and things like that. That's continuer. Yeah, I have two Native American stations I kind of help out when I have opportunity. And so, the you know, there's doesn't have to be a 40-hour or, as uh, Gordon was saying, two days a week. Doesn't have to be even that, but it uh, staying current, even if it uh, we we're talking about uh, turntables and capstans and capacitors. I see Gordon's uh, comment here about the Bell RFMM one. I'm reminded that when we were when I was at BE. And we were selling the FX50. Um, uh, we had to tell our customers. That, Chuck, Sir? that was Sorry? directed at you, so no one else has yeah. read it. Oh, okay. So. so Gordon says, I simply replaced the power supply with a good regulated and improved the signal to noise readings by 20 dB. But to, carry, to amplify on that, Gordon, um, we used to instruct the customers of the, of the people who had just bought FX50s to go to Bellar and ask for one that had been specially modified by, by Arno Meyer, because those were the only ones that could see the signal-to-noise ratio that we were doing. So you're right, Gordon. Interesting. Uh, Mike Shane would like you to put up the uh, list of continuer, res, repeat, retreater, et cetera. Again, sure. I can, for a I moment. can do that. We'll do that. Hold on. First so... Let's 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 see who who else do we have here. I know that uh, uh, Jim Sensenbach is with us. I saw his name pass through here. Um, Rich Wood is a retiree, not from the tech side, but from the programming side. We haven't heard from you yet, Rich. Well, I retired probably. Oh. And a more years ago, uh, prompted by the f direction that talk radio was taking, uh, it wasn't fun anymore. And I had promised myself that uh, once it stopped being fun, I'd go do something else. And about the same time, my rent in New York skyrocketed. And it just prompted me to say, enough, I don't need to be here. Love the city, but uh, it just got to be too expensive. And my dad was um, getting older. I uh, had been away from my family for well, 35 or more years. So I moved back to my hometown and, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, four years ago, he passed. But it was great to, you know, be with my family again. Uh, we're tremendously close family. So I'm probably one of those, uh, what was it, an easy glider? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do whatever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Wood, you just recently retired, did you not? Yes, I retired in July of last year, so I've been retired for not quite a year, and I will say so far it's working out great. Um, I have my hands in a few little projects helping non-commercial stations. I did work at KQED-FM, which was an NPR member station. I still have um, 
a KQED laptop, a KQED two-way, keys to the transmitter sites. And since I was there for so many years, of course, I have a lot of the history. So the remaining engineer, remaining engineers uh, can call me when they want. I had lunch with them uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we discussed a lot of little projects that I had some old knowledge of, uh, help out when I can. I, I did a few things early on that made retirement for me easier. One of those, of course, was always contributing to the 401ks of any of the companies that I worked for. And I started doing that in the early 80s. And so I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford to retire. Uh, so that was a big plus. Um, and uh, now I'm transitioning into the phase where I'm figuring out what to do with my time. I'm at home a lot, so I'm doing a lot of house projects. I'm in this house. It's like, oh, this room needs to be painted. And uh, this, this window needs to be fixed. A hundred of those little things like that. And some bigger things on the horizon as far as house projects are concerned as well. So we can uh, mark you down as not couch potato. Um, I'd have to plead guilty for some of that too, because it is kind of fun to take it easy. You know, I was someone that I accrued a huge amount of vacation because I worked and worked and worked and worked. And back in the dot-com days, I would work for dot-coms after work uh, when I was working for um, Clear Channel in those days. Mm -hmm. I worked on weekends building studios. So I loved doing that work. That was a lot of fun for me. Well, and... there's nothing wrong with, with relaxation. It's it, Chuck, it's one of your, your things there that you've got to take time. You can't be working 24 seven. So I like watching a lot of, uh, you know, uh, British comedy uh, game shows and British dramas and uh, a lot of YouTube videos. So that, that's how I kill a lot of my free time, not to mention old movies, of course. I also go to the gym two or three days a week. That was something that I started doing. I will say that since I've been doing that for about four or five months now, I've really developed a lot of strength that I had when I was younger and kind of lost along the way. And I can work out on the treadmill or the stair machine for a pretty good length of time. And when I started, I would just about drop dead on those things. So I plan to stay healthy throughout my retirement. And Thanks. that requires a little bit of work. Another thing that, that I did that sort of goes along with getting older is I got hearing aids which my hearing had been declining through the years. And I will say they've made a huge difference in my life. I really watch a lot more television without closed captioning now. It's a lot easier to figure out what people are saying in noisy situations. And if I'm sitting there exercising for an hour, books on tape sound great and my Bluetooth enabled hearing aids. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. And I will add, uh, since someone mentioned COVID, I'm one of those engineers, and there were quite a few of them, who actually ended up working a lot harder when COVID hit, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden we were supporting the news staff, the production staff, all figuring out ways for them to work from home. And we had one engineer who was uh, nervous about coming to work, so he was able to work from home because he did most of the um, uh, FM broadcast automation computer work and that worked out great for him but the two remaining engineers took over the load of figuring out how to get you know 30 reporters and production people doing their normal jobs and not to mention the reporters setting up microphones in their garages or wherever they had a spare room to set up and getting all of those going in the beginning a completely over comrex um and and so we we worked our tails off and that continued for a long time and we were in the middle of rebuilding our um the building that the station was in so we were in temporary headquarters so uh, a lot of like i said a lot of people during covid really worked hard and i, I feel bad for anyone that got laid off as a result of it but 
uh, and I also felt a little bad for us working so hard. So I would say that my retirement's been a great plus. I enjoy it. Obviously, I come to these meetings about every week because I've been doing broadcast since uh, since about 1970 in high school, and I think it's always going to be with me. Congress okay. approves. We're 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 glad to have you and appreciate uh, appreciate hearing you know where you're at you're you're settling into retirement and and that's really good um mike shane you uh, have a few thoughts you want to share with us i think yeah um i'm 70 70 and a half when you get to be uh people say you know half years don't matter anymore well they do because the government makes them matter but that's another program um i retired from broadcasting uh almost six years ago but it wasn't my decision uh i really wasn't planning to retire yet uh, i was almost 65 and uh what happened i had a couple of months notice because the company was going to sell the stations and uh, it didn't look like i was going to catch on with the new people though i did they, the stations went to two different owners and i did catch on with one of them for about a month but that didn't work out so ended up retiring anyway from that. Uh, so in a way, I'm a continuer because I have moved into another field, uh, kind of low-level IT work with the experience that I had that I was able to talk about was, you know, uh, important to the uh, employer to for me, for, for them to put me in that position. Um, and uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do um, at first, but uh, my wife had worked for this company in the past and always spoke highly of them as how they treat their people. So I thought, well, if I ever need a job, I should look into that. And uh, I hadn't done that yet, but then uh, something came to my attention that they had an opening. So I went to work for them at first as an interviewer doing surveys. And then after a couple of years, uh, this IT uh, position opened up. So I fit the skills into some modified use first with the interviewing because I talked for a living part of part of my a good chunk of my time in broadcasting. And then now at the IT part, engineering uh, got modified into that. Um, so I'm a little bit of an easy glider because I do really don't have a whole lot of plans right now anyway. Uh, nor am I, I'm not an adventurer or a searcher. Uh, but I have become an involved spectator to some degree. I was asked to produce a weekly radio program. And so I do that every Friday morning uh, before I start my regular job. And uh, that's been a way to kind of remain involved in it. Uh, I also did a little, uh, a li very little bit of engineering work for the same outfit. Uh, where they needed a satellite receiver installed at one of their locations, and I did that for them. Um so that's been my story. Uh, I really didn't think I was going to be prepared financially too well. I may not be, I don't know, but uh, uh, I had a thought that I would probably work till I was maybe 75, um, and that would, that would help the situation uh, where I wouldn't have to tap certain funds until that happened. Um, I probably wouldn't be in that position except for when my mom passed away. She had a somewhat significant estate to pass on, and I was the only heir. Uh, with that, I was able to uh, buy a house and pay cash for it, uh, bought a, an RV, and a uh, used RV, paid cash for that. And uh, my wife at that time, who has since passed, um, uh, and I were decided we would... Uh, take a year off and do some traveling and we did that um, and, and found out I was only 50 at the time found out that uh, gee you know we really can stand each other 24 hours a day <laughs> so uh, it was like okay well we've figured that out so when retirement does come we're not gonna have to worry about that uh, unfortunately she passed before that came I was only 58 mm -hmm. and uh, after about six months after her excuse me, about a year after she, she passed, I, I did marry again. And that's who I'm married to now. Uh, my wife now has a lot of health challenges. So uh, when COVID came along, uh, 
I was able to, I don't want to say it was maybe in 2022, I don't remember exactly, but um, someone in my office got it. And so they said, well, I had started, been set up to work from home. I wasn't using it very much. And they said, well, you just stay home and work from home. And uh, that worked out well because with her problems, she had contracted COVID and had some long-term uh, problems with it. Being able to be home, I can take care of things at home if I need to, if I need to just step away from the computer for a little bit, I can do that. Um, and so that's very handy. I don't know what I would do really right now if they said you have to come back in. Uh, that hasn't happened. What did happen was they said, how would you like to just be permanently at home? And I said, that would work for me. So that's, that's, they said, okay, well, you don't have an office anymore. <laughs> And, a, lot of, a lot of companies have done that, reduced yeah. their, their And that foot. worked out well. So that's that's kind of where we are right now. I'm still working full time. I do this little thing on the side that keeps my hand in the radio thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I also, since I'm working from home, able to uh, take care of my wife's needs for Good. the most part. So, Good. And her daughter lives with us, so she picks up the slack. Or, well, she does more than that, but... <laughs> Uh -huh. Maybe I'm the one that's picking up the slack, if there's any. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, got a note here in the chat from Scott Todd. And uh, he mentions two things here of interest. One, he's still working because he wants the health coverage and extra income. And uh, otherwise could retire, but he's looking for four or more years. that about right scott yeah yeah my wife's got uh, a lot of health problems uh, she's on dialysis and all that her health has been declining quite a bit in the last few years and uh so um, i honestly don't know how much uh, more time she has but uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna i mean she's been hospitalized a number of times and got a lot of medical to uh, pay off. So, I mean, I'd like to retire, but uh, there's not a snowball's chance in H-E double warm that I'll be able to, you know, at least in the short term. So, Well, that's that's the situation. That's one of the problems of age. And one of the reasons sometimes that, as Chuck points out, you want to start planning early, um, if you can. I mean, that's the question, if you can. Uh, Gordon mentions that his planning uh, was to get everything paid off as quickly as he could. And uh, that's uh, that's important. Or as uh, uh, Tim says, uh, no more tower climbing. There are a few tower climbers I know that are in their mid, late 70s. And I don't know. Uh, Go back to uh, go back to what was uh, mentioned there about going to the gym and getting some uh, upper arm strength and such uh, restored, Larry. But I don't know. I, I I think climbing towers is a young man's job. I still climb my own tower. Yeah, but, but you're not seventy five yet. I'm not seventy five yet. At seventy five, I'll stop climbing my own my own twenty five. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I've been asked by clients to, hey, can you replace a line at 100 feet? Can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, but I don't have any insurance for that. I mean, I have a $10 million insurance policy, but not for climbing towers. It's I don't I don't recommend it. But Larry, that's good that you go to the gym. I do as well three days a week. And I think that keeping fit like that is really important. Uh, I gained some weight and got soft when I left Benny Media and decided what the hell I was going to do. And everybody said, Tim, you're getting a pot belly. You need to get in the gym. And I go to the gym three days a week now. And I think that's, that's really, aside from mental, I think physical, you've got to stay active. When you stop being active, I think that's when things start going down. Yeah. I, I still climb towers occasionally too. I have a little project coming up where I'm going to have to uh, uh, repair a low power FM antenna. So uh, but I don't climb 200 feet. That used to be my limit on towers. Uh, I think these days it's probably about 50. I think my last high tower was 500 feet, and that was four years ago. And I got up there, and I'm like, you know, I really don't need to do this thing. I don't make enough money at it. 50 feet? You could rent a lift and do that. 
Exactly. <laughs> I was uh, climbing a ladder to install a solar panel. And the neighbor came over and said, at your age, you shouldn't be climbing ladders. <laughs> He's probably right. <laughs> well, I have been on top of Sutro Tower a few times, but they have an elevator, so that's kind of cheating. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we could get a lift to the site where I, where this uh, low power antenna is currently located. And I don't think they would have the money to do that anyway. Well, I always loved Sutro. I programmed KFOG uh, several eons ago, and uh, we were up there. And I always wanted to go and see it, but I was programming it from Boston. I do well, get it's not as easy as it used to be because of the RF uh, regulations, RF safety regulations. But back in the uh, 70s and 80s, you could just get in the elevator and go to the top when you felt like it. <laughs> well, I, I did to... go to the top of uh, World Trade uh, before 9-11 and uh, didn't feel any tinglys up there. I was on the roof by the antennas. Yeah, Rich, you and I have that in common. I worked for WWHT in Newark TV for a couple of years, if anybody remembers, we'll met go home theater. And uh, the translator was on the North Tower. So I would go up there at 10 o'clock at night in the elevator by myself. And I actually got to know several of the, the guys who rode the building down, unfortunately. But hmm. yeah, that's a, when you're up there at two o'clock in the morning and the building's moving eight to 10 lateral feet, you feel like you're in a boat. Well, yeah, you may know Andy Bader. Yeah. Uh, Andy was our chief at WPIX, mm -hmm. and he took me up there. I was wearing a trench coat and, uh, and a coat and tie, and uh, I didn't realize that uh, when you're out on the catwalk, there are uh, fans. Fortunately, they were intake fans. And I went right in front of one, and all of a sudden, a fan took my coat. <laughs> if it had been an exhaust fan, I probably would have been pushed over the edge. I see. Yeah, I, mean, I was up on that roof several times. It, it, you know, that was a fascinating time back then with all the technology and all the radio stations that were up there. So. I see a few folks here that have uh, uh, entered second careers. And uh, that's, you know, one of the options uh, that we have. Uh, some of you have got into your third career or, or more. And uh, I don't necessarily want to call on anybody here without checking with them to see if they, they don't want to be, uh, be put on the spot. But uh, I, I, think of, I think of some of you that, that I can see here uh, that that are um, now, as I remember, and if you'll really forgive me, Jeff Fairbairn, <laughs> you uh, you were told me you had gone back to school uh, a year or so ago. And what's um, what, where yeah, are you at? Two years now. Well, a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, qualified as a walking tour guide. Yeah. Oh, so you've gone from an engineer at World Radio Network to to tour guide. Wow. I still do some engineering now and then. I help someone out when he's uh, not available, so I'm on call. Uh, and if he's got any projects come up, which is hardly a tool nowadays, but uh, and so I do tours as well. Yeah. Oh, it's really nice to it's really nice to have that relationship, isn't it? So, I got to run. Got another appointment. I got to get to. Well, Chuck, thank you so much for having been with us and raising an issue that really needs attention and a uh, uh, great way to think about it. You're most welcome. And, and Barry, you're welcome to distribute that PDF I sent you. Thank you. Will do. Cheers, all. 73. Yeah. See ya. Thank you.